All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real uh, honor and, and pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank the team at ISI, just wonderful people. And uh, it's really just an honor to be able to participate in one of these conferences. I've just been a big fan of ISI for a long time. And uh, of course, being a Russell Kirk guy, you know, the, the automatic connection there uh, for sure. So, uh, but it's also an honor to participate in a conference about art and beauty and, and how that can inform our modern situation. Um, it's such a unique aspect of the conversation. You know, so often we talk about political or economic um, ways to fix some of our decadence or some of the issues that we have in our culture. Uh, but I believe that the, the role of culture, the role of beauty, the role of art plays a primary role in how we understand human nature, how we understand uh, political realities even, you know, economic realities. Uh, the, the historian and social philosopher Christopher Dawson once said that, or not once, numerous times, uh, said that all politics and economics are downstream from culture. And he meant that in two ways. One, in the sense of artistic creation, artistic expression, but also in the other, in what we worship, right? The, the cultus. So what we worship, what we fill our imaginations with, the, the moral imagination, will become reality, right? It will become our political and economic realities. So if we fill our mind, if we fill our soul with things that are, are ugly, things that are decadent, things that are, are garbage, eventually you're going to see that expressed in your political and economic uh, realities. So while it's obviously of clear importance to reflect on policy and economic realities, um, much of the, the mess we find ourselves, beauty will play a significant role in the process of redeeming our time. As Roger Scruton once wrote, we live in a time where there is much ugliness around us and much desecration. In many ways, a deliberate making ugly of things or a carelessness as to whether things should be ugly or beautiful. So beauty or the lack thereof forms the soul of a people. And as I said, I, I believe it plays a primary role in, in redeeming the time that we're talking about. Uh, just as a little side note, I highly recommend Roger Scruton's uh, little short book, the little Oxford book on beauty. It's an excellent distillation of the tradition and how we can understand it in the modern world. It's only probably about 90 pages too, so it's, it's easily digestible and, and very good, as is everything Scruton. So, <laughs> uh, so today I'm going to speak about um, a man who was a great proponent of the formative nature of art and beauty, the normative nature of art and beauty, which is, of course, Dr. Russell Kirk. Now, I would imagine most uh, of those associated with ISI or participating in uh, local chapters probably know who Russell Kirk is. Uh, but just in case, Russell Kirk was one of the century's foremost men of, of letters. He really broke into the conservative scene after World War II, after the publication of his book, The Conservative Mind, which was published in 1953. Many great conservatives and even libertarians, uh, such as William F. Buckley, the great founder of ISI, uh, have stated that the American conservative movement would not have been possible without Dr. Kirk's publications. Uh, in his time, he wrote over 30 books about politics, economics, culture, education, numerous other topics, uh, of course, many published by ISI. Uh, he was also an award-winning author of ghost stories um, and had great relationships with poets and fiction writers and other creators of, of culture. I personally came to know Dr. Kirk actually through Faulkner University when uh, several of us doctor students um, got to go actually to his ancestral home in Macosta, Michigan. And we spent about a week with his family. We read this uh, lengthy book of essays of his called The Essential Russell Kirk. Uh, and then we were all kind of offered the opportunity to, to write essays about Kirk. And it's, it's funny, I, I grew up in a very uh, pretty much libertarian home. Uh, Rush Limbaugh was our guy <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and I, of course, agree with a lot of that. But Kirk offered me a language, offered me a philosophy that was much closer to the way I understand the world, the way I understand uh, the role of the human person and, and the beauty of tradition. And um, oftentimes, sadly, in the kind of current neocon reality, the, the beauty that Russell Kirk portrays, that he has kind of more of a literary or poetic mind, people don't, often don't understand it. 
They, they just don't get it because they want you know, maybe specific policies or economics. And he was actually kind of famous for not giving specific policies and, 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 and economic realities. He would often point to things like William Scott's um, uh, Waverly novels, right? Which for a lot of people, they, they just, how does that work in reality? But to me, that's where the, the proper philosophy of life, the proper metaphysics, is a, a kind of literary movement, right? Conservatism in a lot of ways is a, a literary movement, and Dr. Kirk provides such a unique way to express what that means. Um, and as I said, what I'm going to be talking about today uh, is his aesthetics. Um, so one of the aspects of Kirk that drew me into this vision um, is this idea of, of beauty. And while you know, some people might think that perhaps he's trying to go back to a bygone age, maybe the, the Middle Ages or uh, perhaps mid-18th century Scotland, um, he knew full well that one can live within the great tradition without being beholden to it. So in other words, the, the modern artist can be challenged not to break with tradition, as has happened in much of modernity, but rather to recapture it to operate within the tradition of the great works of art without losing themselves to the past, without trying to recreate what's in the past, but rather to build something now in this kind of postmodern age that we're in uh, now. So in contrast to much of the postmodernist philosophers, such as Foucault and Derrida and these deconstructionists, um, Kirk actually understood postmodernism as an opportunity for construction, for a recapturing of the beauty um, he understood it as a kind of epoch of time where liberalism is failing and this deconstruction is, is one route that many of the modernist philosophers are going. But he and T.S. Eliot and Christopher Dawson, many of these other great thinkers, they saw the, the kind of slow failing of liberalism as a great opportunity to recapture the modern imagination. He, one of the challenges he threw out to a lot of poets and, and artists was actually to recapture the postmodern imagination. Um, and you do that by holding tight to the great tradition, but operating within the modern experience, right? So not, not neglecting what modern experience offers uh, today. So, and I believe in a lot of ways, that's what we're discussing here at this conference, is how do we hold on to that which is true, good, and beautiful, but convey it or, or recapture it for the modern world? So though Kirk never wrote a, a full philosophical treatise, on the nature of beauty and, and art. He is a tremendous guide to understand why artistic expression and culture is so fundamental to the human person and ultimately to a moral society. So good art forms the moral imagination to desire that which a created human person ought to desire. Kirk provides an excellent way to understand that relationship, uh, the dangers of ugliness, and the few principles, or a few principles on which we can move forward. So Kirk uses Edmund Burke's phrase, moral imagination, on a very regular basis uh, throughout his writing. Uh, Kirk also knew Burke's aesthetic work, the philosophical inquiry into the origins of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful. Uh, but he provides a definition of moral imagination in his book on T.S. Eliot as, quote, uh, the power of ethical perception, which strides beyond barriers of private experience and events of the moment especially, as the dictionary has it, the higher form of this power exercised in poetry and art. The moral imagination aspires to apprehending the right order in the soul and the right order in the commonwealth. So in Burke's rhetoric, the civilized being is distinguished from the savage by his possession of the moral imagination. And the way he understood the order of the individual soul he said the order of the soul flows into the order of the commonwealth, right? So part of what I'm doing, actually, my, my dissertation is actually on Russell Kirk, uh, and it's on the philosophy of personalism and how he expressed that in his own way. And I believe that is such a stable and, and pillar reality of order within myself is what brings order into the commonwealth. So in other words, poetry and art have an essential role in forming the moral imagination. In terms of the function of fine arts, Kirk is primarily concerned with the intellectual and moral formation of a citizen, right? A person, not just the individual, but a person who participates in a community or a republic. 
not primarily for the purposes of the society alone, as I said, but rather for the individual soul. The moral imagination is that which distinguishes the savage from the civilized. Or put in other terms, the moral imagination is that which makes us more fully human. In this view, one of the primary purposes of poetry and art is to awaken the moral imagination and to provide an experiential formation in that which makes us more fully alive. So ignoring the moral imagination makes man nothing more than a beast, right? whereas recognizing it glorifies and awakens the powers of the soul. As he explains, the moral imagination is the principal possession that man does not share with the beasts. It is man's power to perceive ethical truth, abiding law in the seeming chaos of many events. Without the moral imagination, man would live merely from day to day, or rather moment to moment as dogs do. It is this strange faculty, inexplicable if men are assumed to have an animal nature only, or of discerning greatness, justice, and order beyond the bars of appetite and self-interest. The moral imagination shows us what we ought to be. End quote. The, the moral imagination is a, a power of judgment that orders our desires to a greater end. So the bars of appetite and self-interest are overcome by the apprehension of a higher, permanent thing. For Kirk, literature is, of course, one mode of awakening and forming the moral imagination to desire what it ought to. Through literature, through the stories of characters, you, you actually experience the moral imagination. You actually experience uh, transcendence or, or what it means to make certain decisions in certain in events. And it goes into your imagination and your intellect and will. So this term ought is an important distinction of understanding Kirk's philosophical aesthetics as it regards the moral formation and rightly ordering the soul. Roger Scruton makes an important argument that beauty must be considered with the same objectivity that we judge virtue and vice. He says, beauty is therefore as firmly rooted in the scheme of things as goodness. It speaks to us, as virtue speaks to us, of human fulfillment. Not of things we want, but of things we ought to want, because human nature requires them. See, in the modern moment, sometimes that ought is difficult because we're relativists. Right? The, the ought means that there's something higher than ourselves. There's a transcendent order at which we ought to aspire. So man knows he ought to live virtuously, even if he does not quite have the language or self-consciousness to be able to articulate what that means. In the beauty of the arts, particularly the written arts of poetry and literature for Kirk, we experience something through the senses that is judged in our minds. A truly beautiful piece of fine art causes that judgment to desire that which human beings ought to desire. So for example, the many sacrifices of Frodo on his way to Mount Doom, the awakening one feels when reading T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, or the invigoration of Wagnerian extremes, cause mankind to desire something greater than mere fleeting happiness. So much like virtue, if the desire is improperly ordered, then it is of utmost importance that the person experience the awakening of the moral imagination to help discern and reflect on how he might rightly order those desires. There's a great danger in ignoring the moral imagination. As Kirk states, if the moral imagination is denied or suppressed, the person and the republic are bewildered. The decadent logicalism of our century, reflected in much of our literature, is the death of the moral imagination. So we must retrace our steps or perish. Unless humane literature is returned to its normative purpose, telling us what it is to be truly human, the degradation of the human condition may not long be delayed. Sadly, the moral imagination today has been replaced by numerous uh, ideologies, these isms, such as logicalism or determinism, scientism, pessimism, uh, nihilism, uh, and these no longer awaken in man that proper desire for order, virtue, and dignity. One of the problems of modernity that Kirk was at a lot or was a loss of certain norms as they pertain to art. As he says, until very recent years, men took it for granted that literature exists to form the normative consciousness. Think of Plato and, and Aristotle. They clearly knew the role of culture and art in forming a moral people. He continues, that is to teach human beings their true nature, their dignity, and their rightful place in the scheme of things. Such has been the end of poetry in the largest sense of that word ever since Job and Homer. 
As, as Burke states, art is man's nature. It's part of who we are. Numerous philosophers have written on the distinction of mankind from the other animals and that mankind is the sole creature that creates art. Many of these philosophers point to cave paintings as a prime example and no other animal could write Hamlet or compose a symphony. This power belongs to the human being alone. <clears throat> so Kirk has, as I said, a, a keen interest in ordering the soul for the good of the human person. So by knowing what is right and wrong and living in accord with what is right, the human person lives a life fully. Through great art, we come to know and desire what we ought to know and desire. Kurt called these oughts the norms of healthy human society, or what T.S. Eliot calls the permanent things. A norm is an enduring standard, a rule of human conduct and a measure of public virtue. A norm is not the average or mediocre, nor is it limited to one source. It is a rich patrimony of wisdom. Art, whether through literature, poetry, or any other means, ought to express these norms in a way that inspires adherence. Art awakens the imaginative, active intellect and provides the vision of how a properly ordered soul ought to look. The moral imagination and art have a similar end, to awaken the beholder to a sense of the eternal, permanent things, and the wisdom of tradition. And perhaps his most clear aesthetic explanation, Kirk discusses the aesthetics of architecture in an essay called The Architecture of Servitude and Boredom. And this kind of builds off of what Dr. Best talked uh, about last night. So he begins the essay with a story regarding the urban riots of 1981 in Britain. He asked a knowledgeable Scottish engineer about what had caused the troubles in Edinburgh, to which the Scotsman answered, bad architecture. In the essay, uh, Kirk argues that postmodern architecture has left modern man surrounded by boring conditions. From the police stations to the communal housing, the outward appearance has left the residents without any sense of wonder and imagination. Bad design or art leads to decadence and feelings of servitude. The monotony of the modern proletarian cosmo cosmopolis has left, as he said, has left the natives restless. Kirk's primary objective of the essay is not only to point out the problem, but also to find a solution. So for some reason, modern solutions to the issue have not cured the wound. As he says, not infrequently, the public authorities are moved to relieve the barrenness of their urban landscapes by, com by commissioning somebody to design, for a delightful fee, another piece of junk sculpture, product of the blowtorch, to be erected in some place of public assembly. Public funds have been made available lavishly to encourage such artistic frauds. <laughs> Yet somehow, these contributions to a city's amenities do not restore civic virtue. The rates of murder, rape, and arson continue to rise. Kirk explains that when humanity is surrounded by bad architecture and worse art, morality will come to reflect such decadence. Surround mankind with ugliness, and he will be ugly. As I said, art forms man's moral order. Interestingly, uh, this problem is not England's alone, uh, as I'm sure many of you have experienced. I know in my little small towns of North Texas today, uh, in place what have, might have been a, a beautiful space for artistic expression, it's usually blowtorched abstractions that really have no meaning whatsoever. Uh, so Kirk was deeply convicted in the mission to beautify cities again. And he suggested four general principles of urban restor rest restoration which might help to redeem uh, the country from boredom and servitude. These principles are, the architecture of a city and a countryside ought to be adapted to the humane scale. The community called a city must nurture roots, not hack through them. The measure of urban planning should not be commercial gain primarily, but the common good. Civic restoration must be founded upon the long established customs, habits, and political institutions of a community. Sorry. <laughs> so the first principle is based on the humane scale. What Kirk means by this is that a society is not a machine. It is a kind of spiritual corporation. And if treated as a machine, people rebel, politically or personally. Man must not be thought of as a cog in the wheel of a society. If the environment surrounding him is nothing more than the conglomeration uh, communicating use, man will naturally desire to break free from such anti-humanistic modalities of life. Left unchecked, city planning can quickly become to, to look like the London and George Orwell's 1984, in which the buildings are described as cold, dingy, rotten, 
patched with cardboard and their roofs with corrugated iron. The humane scale is based on a personalistic understanding that man is far more than a collectivity. Funnily enough, uh, in Kirk's ghost stories, oftentimes the ideological city planner uh, is most time the villain. Uh, <laughs> in the second principle, Kirk explains the necessity of roots in both a practical and philosophical sense. He states, neighborhoods, voluntary associations, old landmarks, historical monuments, such elements make men and women feel at home. They bind together a community with what Gabriel Marcel calls diffused gratitude. Restoration and rehabilitation almost always are preferable to reconstitution. By diffused gratitude, Marcel means the memory of the past rooted in creativity and fidelity. As Donald Stewart states, um, the gratitude we feel is diffuse and it is not directed to a multitude of, of dead people, but to the spirit embodied in the figure in the past who discovered for us the world of value that inspires us. So for example, uh, in Covington, Louisiana, which um, I have a brother that's a seminarian down there and I love visiting him because that's the home of Walker Percy. Uh, and there's actually a statue of Walker Percy that stands in a small park where he ab appears to be leaning on and peeking through a doorway. And on the doorway is numerous titles of his books. And that simple historical monument invites the locals and the visitors to consider the life and work of a man who lived and walked these very streets and, these, and that these people are walking on, the imaginative reality, the moral fo formation that he was brought up in uh, in Covington. It provides a sense of history, belonging, inspiration, and roots. This principle might put Kirk at odds with the current situation in the United States, which calls for the tearing down of numerous statues that represent a certain understanding of history. The recent cancel, cancel culture desires to erase the histories of many of our founding fathers, as well as writers such as Flannery O'Connor, uh, missionary saints like Junipero Serra. Um, and of course, Kirk would vehemently disagree with the erasure of the past in such a progressive fashion. But he also might challenge the, the anger that's being put towards these uh, statues and monuments with a reminder that the present is certainly not stuck in the past. Rather, like the humane writer he is, he might remind people of their history in its fullest form, scars and all. So when the public gains such insight, we can understand our roots without desiring to rip them out. In this way, art reminds a community of where we come from and perhaps what we certainly do not want to repeat. The third principle calls for architecture of the common good. Commercial gain is not a god to be worshipped in the work of Russell Kirk. Kirk's understanding of the human person as far more than homo economicus, or worth only what he can produce, leaves a sense that man is meant for higher and better things. So by common good, Kirk conveys a good that is ontologically oriented toward what is best for humanity based on the ideals of real human flourishing. Kirk is also concerned with the common good in the sense that what is best for the entire community, not just the wealthy. So when housing is built and given a pricing structure that the poor cannot afford, causing the poor to vacate, the common good is breached and the humane scale has been tipped. The fourth principle on, is the historical process through which a community reached the current reality. Kirk mentions the customs, habits, and political institutions as they represent the means by which a specific community knows itself. As he writes, no planner, however ingenious, can make humanity happy by being stretched upon a Procrustean bread bed of social innovation. Among the deepest longings of humankind is the desire for permanence and security of territory. In other words, a place of one's own. Architecture ought to represent the people who inhabit the environment in which they are placed. This environment ought to memorialize what makes that territory unique. As an aesthetic principle, it appears Kirk celebrates the different cultures and numerous architectural expressions. However, diversity of forms ought to come naturally from within rather than forced top-down aesthetics. So these four principles represent a few practical means uh, in which we can operate in an aesthetic space. So if we were to put these in Kirkian kind of aesthetic terms, art must be Humane, that is, it must speak to the dignity of the human person. It must nurture roots and gratitude for tradition. It must exist for the common good and not just for commercial outcomes. And it must come from within a tradition and a custom. The interesting thing about Kirk is that as much as he is pinned as a traditionalist, he was never opposed to a certain type of progress. 
Instead, he never wanted tradition to be overridden by what he called the cult of progress, meaning that as long as a new thing came along, in this case, artistic expression, it must find itself within the great tradition, not opposed to it. So the boredom and servitude Kirk is rightly fighting against is the existential angst that occurs when the aesthetic environment surrounding a person is opposed to the tradition that understands what mankind needs for fulfillment based on the wisdom of the centuries before us. Kirk's own aesthetic taste is actually quite interesting. He, he loved traditional pieces of music and art, uh, but he also enjoyed the haunting paintings of René Riddell. And if you get the chance to visit his home, uh, there are numerous pieces that could be described as strange or a bit confusing, uh, but beautiful in their own right. So for Kirk, that line between high and low culture, or what we might call folk culture, ought not to be so sharp of a distinction as we see today. For Kirk, a conservative ought to preserve the more folkish expressions of culture. However, the sharp distinction between high and low causes a, a, a separation between the masses and the learned or the wealthy. Kirk firmly believed that what is best is a combination of the two, a more aristocratic appreciation of high culture in that it cultivates and forms the mind right alongside low or popular culture creates a conservative with imagination, intelligence, and practical wisdom. The funny thing about his own uh, aesthetic taste, um, I, I tend to say that he actually probably would have felt more at home with the Adams family than Leave it to Beaver. Um, he, he really loved the strange and the ghostly. Um, which, what he truly despised was vulgar culture, which he describes as popular culture entrenched and interpreted by ideology. Think of the recent uh, Disney videos coming out. Uh, it's clearly ideologically driven to form the imagination of children. Kirk was so upset with this type of vulgar culture that he actually once threw a television set out of his second story window of their home in Macosta. Uh, modernity has handed over what was traditionally created by attachments to family, religion, and tradition to what he calls the bureaucrats, scientists, technicians, trade union organizers, publicity experts, sociologists, journalists, and professional politicians. Artistic expression has been vulgarized through a removal of what makes for humane uh, formation. However, this does not mean that Kirk thought that the project was lost. His own stories, his own ghost stories, are a sign of hope that he wanted to help save popular culture. Believe it or not, he actually made most of his money from his ghost stories. Um, and he has won the Dracula Award and several other <laughs> places within that kind of ghostly uh, tradition. And that actually comes from his own experience. His, his family was actually spiritualists, uh, and they would do seances and all kinds of stuff uh, in his ancestral home. And uh, he saw ghosts uh, when he was a child. He fully believes that. And so uh, his, his kind of love of the strange and the, the quite scary. Uh, there's actually an essay that he has on the role of, of fear in moral uh, formation which is a quite interesting one considering the kind of beauty and fear and how that works. Uh, but it's an interesting uh, essay for sure. Another aspect of Kirkian uh, postmodern uh, aesthetic is a return to, the, to an understanding of the cause of artistic inspiration. So if science, politics, and other worldly concerns do not provide enough impetus to answer life's deepest questions, where are the causes of the art that can? In considering the reality of capturing the postmodern imagination, Kirk turns to Christopher Dawson. One of Kirk's favorite historians, historians, Dawson, viewed religion as the spring from which all culture flows, whether it be politics, family life, or the creation of art. In an essay entitled Our Sacred Patrimony, Kirk quotes Dawson's book Religion and Culture, in which Dawson states, the recovery of moral control and the return to spiritual order have become the indispensable conditions of human survival. But they can only be achieved by a profound change in the spirit of modern civilization. This does not mean a new religion or a new culture, but a movement of spiritual reintegration, which would restore the vital relation between religion and culture, which has existed at every age and on every level of human development. Kirk follows this quotation with a hearty amen to that. So the modern notion that religion is just a type of fence or, or something that is uh, up to the individual or, or something that's just personal and you don't want to share, uh, it keeps people, or just something that keeps people morally in line, would be completely obtuse uh, to Kirk and would ultimately be doomed to failure or potentially used for manipulation of people. As Kirk also wrote in Civilization Without Religion, one of, I think, his best essays, 
Some well-meaning folk talk of civil religion, a kind of cult of patriotism founded upon a myth of national virtue and upon veneration of certain historical documents, together with a utilitarian morality. Worship of the state or the national commonwealth is no substitute for communion with transcendent love and wisdom. People will conform their actions to the precepts of religion only when they earnestly believe the doctrines that the religion to be true. So in regard to aesthetics, real artistic inspiration comes from a connectedness, a conversational relationship with a higher transcendental, transcendental, ah, transcendental quality and story of humanity. Even before Kirk's conversion to Catholicism in, in 1964, Kirk firmly believed in the grounding quality of religion and a transcendent God. Culture, rooted in the cultus or the cult, is fundamentally a religious act. So Russell Kirk was a man of wisdom, vision, and imagination. Though he never wrote a specific theory of philosophical aesthetics, he did provide principles of practical beauty in architecture, poetry, and causality. To the question of whether or not beauty can save the world, Kirk would have likely answered in the affirmative, so long as there is an understanding of the purpose of beauty. Like the traditional understanding of the ethical outcomes of art, Kirk solidly taught that art should form the correct ought, a virtuous understanding of the soul. Art ought to inspire the good and the true. Through this formation, the soul is properly ordered to that which makes us more human. The moral imagination is that which provides a concrete experience and awakens a desire for the transcendent. These oughts all express the ultimate religious needs and questioning of human nature. And the cause of art we create to answer those ultimately come from Rand's religiosity. Another aspect of this uh, need for beauty today that I believe as, as Kirk explains through tradition and, and a humane understanding of it, um, there's this great theologian named Hans Urs von Balthasar. Uh, if you haven't read his stuff, I highly recommend it. Um, but at one point he explains the, the role of beauty when it comes to the good and the true. And what he says is that so often we can find ourselves in a polemic or a disagreement in the modern world of what's good and true, right? So your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, right? Goodness is goodness for you, but not necessarily for me. But he said that beauty has what's called an arresting quality. Right? There, there's something innate in beauty that you start from a place of agreement rather than disagreement. I and mean, if you take someone to, you know, who might be a hardened atheist or a progressive or whatnot, you take them to the Sistine Chapel and you both appreciate and, and love what was created there, you're now starting from a place of agreement rather than disagreement. Right? And then from the beautiful, you've now formed this kind of bridge of trust or this, this friendship, this shared love of something that's part of our thing as human persons. Right? And then from there, it can grow into conversations about the good and, and the true. So Kirk's aesthetics were imaginative and literary, much like his expression of conservatism. The moral imagination, formed in the transcendent power of beauty through poetry and story, provides the, a human life worth living, and a properly ordered sensibility which gives the best opportunity for happiness. For Kirk, aesthetics were incredibly important because if a society gets it wrong, human nature suffers and will ultimately fail. As he stated, the unimaginative human being is dully confined to the provinciality of time and provinciality of place. Right? Beauty gives you the opportunity to transcend the, the modern moment, to transcend the, the current evils, to transcend the current structures, and, and to think more broadly, to think from, a, from almost a divine perspective. So however, in a truly postmodern mentality, we, we ought not lose hope. As I said, one of Kirk's great projects was to inspire artists, to inspire creators, to participate within the great tradition, but to fully understand the, the modern experience of how to take the good, the true, and the beautiful and speak to the modern world. It's not a, a revisiting to the old. It's a, it's a love of the old, the, a love of the tried and true, but to express that through new language and through new story, new poetry, new art, new architecture in a way that, it, that is, is comfortable for even the modern sensibility. So we seek the truth of things through the imagination and strive to enliven our existence through the permanent wisdom of the ages. As he described himself, the one high talent with which he had been endowed was imagination, 
the power of raising up images of truth and terror in the mind. Through images, he had come to know something of the world beyond the world. Aesthetics has the ability to awaken in man the desire for more than the material things of this world. And Kirk provided a few frames within which a good artistic expression can exhibit the transcendent. And I believe, as I said, the, the role of beauty, I think we can all agree, we're in this strange moment uh, in history of this kind of decadent uh, reality and, and so much fighting and, and back and forth. I, I think it's, it's important to find those places where we can agree on that which is good. Uh, and beauty and art and culture provides a lot of that. It provides the ability to, as I said, start with a place of, of agreement, start with a place where there's a shared love of, of culture. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Uh, you know, there are some who are ideologically uh, disposed to try to tear down that which is beautiful and, and traditional. Uh, but I, I think that it, it plays a significant role uh, in the modern world and in the modern understanding of what we ought to do uh, as, as a country and as a people. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Pay attention. My question's good. Thank you. <laughs> so who is someone today that we can point to in the vein of Russell Kirk that their art exemplifies beauty and points us towards man's moral order? One's back there. James Matthew Wilson, I would say. <laughs> Dana Joya would be another one, I think, as far as being a poet. Um, I, I would hold my own boss, Bishop Robert Barron, as somebody who holds the, the role of beauty and culture out as a, as a primary role of kind of healing a lot of the division we have today. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. quick. <clears throat> right. um, how can we negate lower income communities from gravitating towards this Orwellian future that you were discussing earlier? S say it again, sorry. How can we negate uh, lower income communities from gravitating towards like this Orwellian destiny that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, and that's a big project, uh, and it may be a generational one, to be honest, because I think a lot of it has to do with, with formation. Um, a lot of it also has to do with familial ties. You know, we've got a pretty serious fatherless epidemic right now in the country, and a lot of it is, unfortunately, in the poorer communities. Um, and a lot of that ties into the inability to get kind of up and out of, of poverty. But a lot of it has to do with, I think, formation. Um, I think a lot of it also has to do with the removal of policies that keep companies from doing certain things to help the poor open businesses and um, you know, offer more protection for those businesses as they, they grow. Uh, but I don't know if I can give just a simple answer <laughs> uh, to that one. It's a pretty large uh, discussion for sure. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do we ask all the questions for the table or is it one by one? Just all of them? Okay. Just rapid uh, fire. Yeah. All right. So um, we were talking about uh, satire and if it can be beautiful. And the first thing that comes to my mind is South Park as a, a peak <laughs> form of satire. <laughs> um, and clearly the, the, the creators are conservative. But we were wondering, can satire be beautiful? Mm, that's a really interesting question. Uh, in, in the sense that it gets you to think beyond yourself and think outside of your kind of uh, as I said, there's kind of that transcendent quality that, that leads towards God, but that wouldn't necessarily, <laughs> South Park probably isn't doing that. Um, <clears throat> but it, it does get you to think beyond what we might kind of consider our own kind of, um, as Alistair, or, uh, the, the Charles Taylor calls the buffered self, right? We, we place ourselves in these little bubbles and don't allow new information to come to us unless we agree with it. And sometimes satire just punches right through that. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I guess it could do a similar thing as, as beauty, uh, for sure. I do think it can connect people, though. Uh, comedy is a great way to allow each other to kind of laugh at our eccentricities, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, uh, next question. Um, so t today's uh, TV shows, is in, they're, they're kind of crap and highly sexualized, but um, there, there was, we were talking about anime and how um, there was actually um, some Christian symbols. And uh, one example, I haven't seen it, but in Evan Evangelion, apparently the creators used a bunch of Christian symbols simply because they thought they looked cool. Hmm. And they, they just kind of like threw them on, on, on the screen. And even with that in mind to a Western audience, you can actually put together some themes that still actually could tie into the story, sure. even though they kind of didn't really think much of it when they put them on screen. And so we were wondering, can this beauty of tradition still be recaptured even by such a uh, rapid fire or like splashing of that all over the canvas. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think that, and I, I don't know anime that well, but I've actually heard from some people that there are some great storytelling happening oh, yeah. in, in anime. And to me, any good story leads to the great story, right? Uh, the great story of God's revelation of Christ uh, as, as a man. 
And so um, I, I think that the kind of rapid fire thing, some of it could be a, a, a way to remember our symbols and a way to kind of keep those in the imagination. Whether or not those can lead to greater thinking, I think the story itself will do that. I, I think that uh, I see even like a lot of artists and stuff wearing rosaries and all this stuff, but they don't really quite have a religious expression of what that means. It's just something beautiful. Um, and in a way, we can start there. Um, something we talk about at Word on Fire a lot is uh, what we call the semina verbi. It's like these little places where the, the seeds of the great word, so the capital W word, can be found. And, and how can we locate those seeds and then sh show people why they're beautiful, why it actually expresses something far larger. I mean, the, the fact that we wear crucifixes or crosses, regardless of being Christians, is fascinating because, I mean, that's a, a, a symbol of torture, <laughs> ultimately, right? But because of our tradition, because of the, the great story that is now kind of just in the blood, whether we want to recognize it or not, we, we see it as something beautiful. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, and last one. So this is clearly uh, the value of the beauty and tradition of Western tradition and values. Um, and I was thinking about like, what about other traditions and can they be adapted in a similar form of beauty? Absolutely. Uh, it's funny, I actually uh, have a son named Bruce and I named him after Bruce Lee. Um, I absolutely love Bruce Lee films. I think he was a great philosopher uh, and he offered a lot about what it means to be a dignified human person. And I think a good program can integrate East, West, South, North, all of that. Uh, together and show, especially as we've been kind of talking about here, the anthropological aspect of it, um, that the beauty of the human person, regardless of what tradition you're, you're coming from. Uh, so yes, I guess would be my, my answer to that. I think ultimately, I'm a Catholic, so I believe that Christianity is the ultimate expression of human dignity and all of that, um, but that doesn't mean we can't find the goods within every tradition. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, so I'm a computer science major, Great. and one thing that does uh, worry me at times, especially more recently, is when, you know, we're here talking about this need for natural spaces and such, but, and, you know, spaces that, you know, bring back our sense of tradition as a culture and a people, but yet we're very, it does seem, especially now, like with this push towards this sort of, you know, AR, VR world, metaverse, quote unquote, mm -hmm. where that will be, Perm very much, if anything, if it will be permanent in any way, it will be permanently ephemeral. Um, I mean, the average lifespan of a digital file is like three to seven years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess, do you think that to an extent there actually may be a certain ticking clock in terms of the time that we have to actually, you know, see us make some headway in achieving the goals that we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, this is already metaverse. Yeah. <laughs> We're already like this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, now, meta, the actual metaverse is going to take it to a, another mm -hmm. level for sure. Um, there's actually a, a, a book coming out, um, I believe spring of next year, by a priest down in Florida named Father Blake Britton mm -hmm. called God and Gaming. And in it, he actually talks about the beauty of video games and mm -hmm. the landscapes and the soundtracks and all of that and how it's in a way expressing what I kind of express. Mm -hmm. It's like you're, you're experiencing something. But I do think part of the role of, and of course I think like an evangelist, somebody who wants to bring people to, to Christ, is to actually go into those worlds to get them out, to get them back into an incarnational reality. That doesn't mean that those are evil. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that those are like inherently bad or, or anything, but it does mean that like human fulfillment, human, uh, fully human life can't be lived in yes. the virtual. Um, and so it has to be uh, in that. But as far as the, the ticking time, um, I don't know. I have a lot of worries, <laughs> to be honest. You know, I don't I, know where I, this is going. I do feel like this could soon end up, like, you know, not quite Orwell's yeah. 1984, but more like Disney's 1984. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or Brave New World yeah. with the screens, mm -hmm. right, uh, with the, for the wife. But, um, yeah, I, I have some pretty serious concerns about where virtual reality is going. Uh, I, I think that part of what all of us are called to do is be very intentional on incarnational relationships and incarnational conversations about these things. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. What would you say is the dividing line between subjective and objective beauty standards? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so Dietrich von Hildebrand, a uh, great philosopher and theologian, um, he said there is a difference between subjectively satisfying and objectively valuable, right? So I can find a certain type of music. Um, I don't know. I, I love heavy metal. I love rap. I love all kinds of stuff. 
that is subjectively satisfying. I enjoy the beat, I enjoy, but that you can't compare that to Bach, right? It's two totally different things. And I think part of the process of recognizing that difference is, is maturation, of becoming more fully human and becoming more of an adult, really. Uh, starting to learn what's objectively valuable and good for a community versus what just makes me kind of take my foot, right? <laughs> Um, I don't know if that kind of helps answer that question. I, the dividing line is a little bit less clear to me, um, mm -hmm. but I do think that most people can kind of express it whenever they, they experience it mm -hmm. of, I enjoy this, but this isn't even close to, like I, I enjoy a lot of the modern sci-fi novels and stuff like that, but I can't compare that to C.S. Lewis's Palandria series, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's two totally different things really in, your, in how you're expressing the language that's being used, um, all of that. So. I don't know if the line is all that clear, and sometimes it can be per person, to be honest, of, of what is actually uh, the difference between those two. But I think Hildebrand's distinction between those two is very helpful. Okay. Thank yeah, you. you so this one also has an element of like objective versus subjective in regards to culture, because often we talk about culture like it's an intrinsically good thing. So when there, when there are obvious uh, differences in the objective beauty and goodness of a culture, how do you engage a whole culture um, into promoting uh, true beauty to come from within that culture to fill their space? I think part of it is actually forming artists to, to operate within that culture. Um, so create good rock musicians, create good you know poets that can go into kind of these secular spaces of, of poetry. Um, and, and I would say there's on, honestly, probably not a top 